Conflict is on the rise in rural Saskatchewan over how to manage the competing needs of water, wetlands, and agriculture. At the center is a practice known as drainage, where people intentionally move surface water, in some cases from wetlands, so that they can crop on the land. But the issue has many contours, and few people describe it in quite the same way. Drainage can range from something that's very subtle, where uh, someone is simply contouring the land a little bit to move water down into certain places on a field, all the way up to highly organized ditching that then moves large quantities of water to um, streams, rivers, lakes, uh, what have you. Drainage is a really misunderstood concept in the province of Saskatchewan. Water drives agriculture and water definitely is one of those resources that does need to be managed, whether you have too much or you have too little. If you have too little, you will irrigate. If you have too much, you need to manage that through drainage. It's such a contentious word. For me, drainage is still about managing the water and it's about removing the excess water in a way that is not harmful to your neighbors, to your environment, to your community. Uh, and at the same time, drainage is a term that means keeping all the water you need to grow the crop and, and using all the water you can. I don't know that we're always all talking about the same thing, but it can include a variety of practices. Um, one is as simple as infilling a wetland, uh, building ditches um, to drain a wetland. Uh, it can be increasing water flow through an existing ditch. Um, pumping water out of a wetland, uh, and so on. So a variety of practices that have um, similar impacts in terms of functionally the loss of wetlands in the landscape. You go from a very uh, heterogeneous sort of pond environment that has wetlands of very different sizes and depths down to these sort of consolidated wetlands where there's only a few that might remain on a quarter section and they're more permanent deeper and they have very different um, ecologies. What many people may not realize is that the challenge of drainage and the impacts that people are seeing today are tied up in really complex histories. This has been going on for years. Many of the more ephemeral wetlands, those that only lasted for short periods of time in the spring, have or, had been eliminated perhaps 50 years ago, maybe even longer. What's happening more and more now, since a lot of those wetlands have already disappeared, is that uh, we see still primarily small wetlands being amalgamated with others into areas adjacent to fields, along roads, and so on, so that producers can work their fields with fewer obstructions. There's larger equipment now, and so a lot of producers just want to make operating the equipment a lot simpler. Drainage has evolved over time, and so that early settlement drainage is roads and ditches and some culverts and things like that. But what has changed in the last 10 or so, maybe 15 years, is the use of GPS equipment and uh, positioning equipment that gets people to be able to drain centimeters at a time uh, with really high accuracy and uh, a lot of horsepower. <laughs> and so you see the efficiency that people are installing surface drainage uh, skyrocket. And this complex history is not just a story of unintended consequences or disregard for the environment. Each part of the province has its own unique story, in some cases tracing back into deep colonial conflicts, which over the years dramatically changed the way that water is moving in the prairies. And it goes to the Riel Rebellion and uh, the Battle of Duck Lake and uh, there had been uh, a rail line had been constructed to, uh, towards Carleton and uh, that was in anticipation of future uh, uh, possible disputes with the First Nations. Eventually they decided to, to uh, redirect the line to Duck Lake. And that, when that line was constructed, I believe, in the early 1900s, they, they didn't take into account the uh, current uh, uh, watershed of, of the 
Duck Lake itself. There was no master drainage plan at the time, and there's still no master drainage plan. But not only that, uh, Ministry of Highways, uh, Highway 11, twin, uh, which is now a twinned highway, diverted the natural flow of the lake, viewing uh, 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 the, the topology of the land it was impossible that it would naturally f flow that way. So there was a lot of excavation to construct this canal to divert these waters, but it still didn't solve the problem of, of, uh, of addressing drainage and, and flooding of the lands. As the elders had uh, uh, mentioned in the past, they, uh, they don't want to see all the water removed. Uh, we believe that it does play an integral, important, crucial factor in there. Uh, however, I think better strategies had could have been approached and and uh, and implemented today uh, to resolve all of these uh, current issues that we're dealing with. Conflicts over resources can be tragic. People get polarized, whether because of the media or because the loudest voices are the ones that dominate the discussion. When conflicts escalate, people stop hearing each other. Instead, they respond to stereotypes. But underneath it all, people generally share more values than they realize. They agree more than they disagree. Saskatchewan is one of the most important jurisdictions in the prairies for wetlands and all of the biota, all of the birds, amphibians, insects, mammals, and so on, that are associated with wetlands. I think part of the issue or some of the conflict and confusion comes from the definition of a wetland because scientifically we cast a fairly wide net. Not everyone uh, would necessarily see the same thing when they look at a landscape. They might consider it a glorified puddle, so it, it becomes a question of um, do we, are we all talking about the same thing? So, you know, wetlands, uh, it, it's first of all a, a relatively new term for me. You know, in my time, we called them sloughs and lakes and creeks and, and all of that. And so wetlands, I, I think, uh, personally, is, is maybe a bit of an invented term by people with a particular agenda. When we use the term wetland drainage, that uh, farmers would feel that that also applies to maybe sloughs on their property or areas that are not holding water, you know, three or four out of 10 years, <laughs> that they're farming through that area and it's a productive area of land for them. I think that uh, maybe causes some animosity between the two communities, is uh, really struggling to say what is uh, wetland drainage and being able to classify. Here's the wetland, here's the area that we're concerned about maintaining for habitat and other reasons and to come to the table from the farmer's side saying, okay, but don't attack these other areas that we are managing on our own. The challenges are really around how are wetlands a benefit and how are wetlands a detriment. And, you know, prairie communities um, can have benefits from wetlands in terms of factors like protection from floods. Um, However, if you're a producer farming your land, wetlands can, can be a detriment in terms of having to move your equipment around them and having basically losing some of the area you might otherwise want to cultivate. So the problem or the question lies around um, which wetlands we really need to keep in the landscape, which wetlands perhaps could or should be farmed, um, and whether we've changed the landscape in a way that won't be as resilient to future stresses like climate change. I usually don't like to talk about e anything economics, about water, because I don't want people to think that it's just about that, because it isn't. Um, but back to these younger farmers, um, you know, they're expanding, they're carrying a lot of debt. Um, they can't take any sort of a hit. Um, and these are the you know, these are the people that are keeping these small towns alive. Uh, Half of the community uh, of, uh, of the reserve is, is, is prime agricultural lands, eh? and so that is where the water floods. And we measured minimum at that time in 2007, 
9,000 acres of flooded lands, and including infrastructure, roads, and so forth. The decision that each individual landowner makes might seem as though it's, it's a very small thing, uh, you know, with very little impact. But when you get many people taking the same action of just knocking out a little bit more habitat, one or two more wetlands, that accumulates. That has a big impact when you add it up over larger areas. I think the bottom line is it is a balancing act. A solution or an outcome should be future drainage should consider and have to justify why this is the best option and consider how any negative effects might be mitigated. When trying to manage conflicts, to short circuit the escalation, it is critical that people find a way to really see each other again. People can feel threatened and act defensively, so a first step needs to be in finding common ground so that people on either side of an issue can take steps forward together. I don't think that drainage per se is the major problem. I think it's actually how do we manage water and wetlands on the landscape and how do we better manage that so that drainage doesn't become the only option. A big movement in my own research is to find solutions for how to better manage the land that contains wetlands so that it's not the only option when a producer wants to, you know, grow more food or wants to increase his production, that he sees that his only option is to get rid of the, the water altogether. Saskatchewan Farm Stewardship is a farmer-based association that was created out of a situation where farmers were dealing with excess water and their hands were tied with their ability to manage that ex excess water. We want farmers to be able to manage that resource on their land themselves in a responsible way that doesn't negatively impact neighbors or downstream owners. We learned early on is managing water, it, it's not about digging a ditch and dumping it into the neighbors. Uh, within a community, you won't have very many friends and you might have some trouble if you do that. What we learned was, if we, the more water we could hold on our farm, if there was a big rain or if there was a big snow melt, the more water we could hold and then let it go slowly, the better off it was for the town and, and the better off it was for the community. I think people don't understand that, so they feel that um, if a cottage owner is, is uh, flooded out, that, that that's caused by agricultural water management. And it can be if it's open ditches, but if it's control structures and control flow, it actually mitigates that flood potential. A lot of the uh, perception of what uh, ag water management is, is somebody out with a trackle draining a small lake. That's not the case. I don't have a trackle. Hardly anybody does. Um, and again, that kind of stuff is the stuff that has to stop. Farmers love the land. They are preserving that land for often the next generation. They care for that land and that water because they want that resource available for their next generation. They manage it so they can protect their rural infrastructure, the roads they drive on, so they can protect the downstream communities that their families go to school in, that their families shop in. So why wouldn't they want to manage it responsibly? For an example, there's an old yard site here, just half a mile by my yard, and you know it's in the middle of a field, and you got to go around it. It's actually square; doesn't really hurt much, but you're farming, so you got to get rid of it, and you got to grow grain there. That's just that's your mentality. But one thing that it just kind of it changed my thinking is when this with this water issues, I guess um, that changed my thinking. Long story short, like that yard site is still standing and it uh, always will be. Because yeah, I'll, I'll grow a little bit of grain there. Will I make money on it? Yes. But you know what? Like there's some deer there, uh, there's some birds. There's a little burrow pit there for some water. I'm just gonna leave it. You know, on our farm, we have about 8,000 acres. Uh, most of it we own. And of that 8,000 acres, there's 1,000 acres that we don't farm. And some of that, we can't farm. And some of it would be hard to farm. Uh, 
but a lot of it is just I, I would say wilderness or wildlife land or you know another word people use is habitat but out in the middle of the home section there's a bush and it's just a bush it's it's not a slough well there's a bit of a slough in it I guess but it's mostly black poplar and it's five acres and man is it ever in the way when you're farming like it's in the way so I asked my dad and this is a long time ago I don't I was 25 years old I asked my dad like why are we farming around this bush, Dad? Why don't we bring the cat in here and knock it down? And Dad says, you know, like the wildlife have to have a place too. So the bush is still there. People may not agree on the specifics of how to address this challenge, but replacing animosity and mistrust with a common vision for a healthy and prosperous prairie communities and landscapes is a step that everyone, if they're willing to try, can build on. What people have to remember Anybody that's involved in this conflict is that, you know, if you just take a step back and realize everybody wants the same thing. When we think about managing an individual parcel of land, you know, it's simple. It's what an individual wants and is best. But as you think about the impacts on downstream neighbors and downstream communities, you really need to have that larger group of people at the table um, and that science-based understanding of how the water moves and what an impact from the most upstream site will mean on the most downstream sites and some of the vulnerable areas in between. Wetland management wasn't taken into consideration a uh, decade, two decades ago, but I believe that's starting to change. Uh, water, to me, as I mentioned, is a spirit. Uh, it's essential to, to all life. It is uh, in relation with land is the foundation of, 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 of everything who we are. And if it means that much, we should be networking and putting aside our differences. Uh, this is not an uh, indigenous, non-indigenous issue. This is a people issue, an animal issue, it's a wildlife, it's an environmental issue, it's a, it's a world issue. This new research is based on a participatory approach where we are working with producers who are implementing the solutions and we are there to study um, and share with them what we find. I think it's really important to try and get the message out there that there is a different way of doing things. And, and that we are stewards of the land, and we are trying to do the best for our communities and our families and for our province. So many producers across this beautiful area of Canada who have been productive um, crop or livestock producers for years and have retained many wetlands, have retained many areas of trees, shrub, grassland, small areas, they're still there. Their family might have been farming for a hundred years and they're still there and they can coexist with the, all these components of the natural environment and still make a good living. I do feel they co can coexist when you talk about wetlands and farming coexisting because it's not, no farmer ever says, I want to drain all of the wetlands off my farm. That's not their goal. The goal is that they're able to effectively manage their land and their water. I certainly think that there's room for farming and wetlands to exist together on the landscape. And I think we're at a point now where that needs to be done in a, in a management way to acknowledge that both are there and to come up with some plans as to how we're gonna maintain that wetland area as farming you know, continues to be a source of livelihood. We, we also have to take into consideration the traditional and cultural values of that land. And more importantly, future generations. Uh, as stated by elders, uh, we borrowed the land from, from the children what little we have in our little neck of the woods or corner of the world is precious 
and it should be considered that. And that should be our driving force to, to communicate and network with everything, with everybody.